Arizona is home to 22 tribal nations and more than 340,000 Native Americans. Arizona State University builds on more than six decades of working and partnering with tribal nations and communities. Many of our Native faculty incorporate Indigenous knowledge systems in seeking solutions through a process of community engagement that respects and honors traditional ways of thinking. Together, we are creating community solutions leading to a more equitable future. Is Indian Country Today. Kuwatsi Hopa, thank you for joining us. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Pope Francis has agreed to meet in December with Indigenous survivors of Canada's residential schools. This move comes after calls for an apology from the Catholic Church for its role in the abuse and deaths of thousands of Native children. APTN News interviewed First Nations Chief Perry Bellagarde about the announcement. He reacted saying, there are no guarantee that when the indigenous delegation travels to the Vatican, it would, it would lead to an apology that they want. But he said, quote, we have to make the attempt. The Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops said Francis had invited the delegation to the Vatican and would meet separately with three groups who are First Nations, Métis, and Inuit during the meeting. After the individual meetings with the tribal nations, the Pope will then meet with them collectively, according to the Conference Association. Native students who are a citizen of one of the 48 tribal nations with historic ties to Colorado are now eligible to receive in-state tuition, even if they don't live in the state. Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera says in 2019, 19% of native 18 to 24 year olds were enrolled in college compared to 41% of the overall population. This was a key reason to put the law into effect. So to give kids a better opportunity uh, just felt really great. The bill was signed into law Monday by Colorado's Governor Jared Polis and will go into effect beginning in the fall. The move will ultimately make school more affordable. The cost of undergraduate tuition for one year at the University of Colorado Denver is $25,000 for out-of-state students compared to $9,000 for in-state students. The governor also signed another bill Monday that requires any public school in Colorado to get formal approval from a tribe if they have an American Indian mascot. Failure to do so will result in a $25,000 monthly fine. A newly renovated entertainment center is opening tomorrow at the Tachi Palace Casino Resort in California. The Tachi Yoku tribe owns and operates the casino resort in Limor, California, which is about 200 miles north of Los Angeles. When the space first opened in 2018, it was designed in a way that presented challenges for growth but the pandemic presented an opportunity to remodel the space while it was closed. So when COVID happened, it provided us the ideal opportunity to take in and reinvest in the property and fix those operational, those design challenges to make it more of a communal experience, which it was intended to be. The state-of-the-art Coyote Entertainment Center now features family-friendly activities like more movie theaters and a 30-lane bowling alley. The casino resort's general manager, Michael Alugic, says the renovations cost the tribe about $400,000 to complete. Ultimately, the tribe hopes the entertainment center will increase revenue and serve as a place for tribal citizens. The future of powwow MCs is starting to look a lot more feminine. As part of Indian country's contemporary culture, the powwow MC is usually someone funny who helps to keep the people entertained. Deanna Ray Standing Cloud definitely has the jokes. She also has the voice and the skill. Now she just needs more opportunities to show it. Standing Cloud, who is Red Lake Ojibwe and lives in Minneapolis, is one of the few female powwow MCs in a male dominated field. There's women breaking barriers in a lot of industries, and I'm just really excited to be a part of this one. Um, and yeah, it's 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 medicine, and it um, those are those interactions were 
kind of what made it special and it was like this is what it's for this is why we do this so it was good it was good medicine for my spirit now that powwows and other social gatherings are coming back after a months long pandemic d ray wants her voice to be heard too to read more visit indiancountrytoday.com and search for the headline her powwow voice and those are the headlines from indian country today i'm alia chavez when we come back, we meet some creative natives. Stay tuned. This is Indian Country Today. First People's Fund was recognized with a $6 million investment from Mackenzie Scott. It's part of a wider $2.7 billion gift to 286 high-impact organizations that have been historically overlooked. Stuart Huntington reports. Lori Poirier has been working for decades to bring positive change to Native communities and knows firsthand how difficult it is sometimes to find funding. I've been doing this work more than 25 years in Indian country, and for the past 20 years or so, less than 1% of all philanthropic dollars have gone to Native causes and concerns, and that has not changed in the last 20 years. But perhaps the large donation from Scott is indication of progress. I'm just deeply, deeply, deeply grateful for this gift because it really allows us to give us that time to breathe and, and um, you know, continue the important work in tribal communities. Scott keeps a low profile. One of the world's richest people, she gave away $6 billion last year and made scant comment. Most of her donations, including to First People's Fund, come with no restrictions. For Poirier, that means that her fund can keep doing what it does best. First People's Fund works to preserve and, and help protect ancient traditions that have gone on for thousands of years. And First People's Fund um, helps, uh, helps artists uh, by recognizing their work, but also by assisting them in many different ways uh, to keep those traditions going and keep them alive for not just for this generation, but for uh, those generations yet unborn uh, that are to come into the world. So. The work that First People's Fund does is vital in these areas. And now the future of that vital work is a bit more secure. Stuart Huntington, Indian Country Today. Native Voices at the Autry Museum of the American West has a new audio feature. The New Adventures of Super Indian is streaming online for free until July 28th. Joining us is the creator of Super Indian, Aragon Starr, who herself is super talented. She's a musician and actor. She writes plays and is the illustrator of Super Indian. What's exciting about the new adventures of Super Indian is uh, seeing my work come full circle back to Native Voices at the Autry. There, that's a theater company based in Los Angeles at the Autry Museum of the West. And um, in 2006, there was an in initiative for radio uh, people to come you know, and learn how to do audio theater, which is something that harkens back to way back in the day. And, you know, like the days of radio serials. So um, Super Indian was written as a 10 minute episode presented at the National Audio Theater Festivals in 2006. And then in 2007, the Autry decided to produce more episodes of the show. So um, we did 10 five minute episodes that were eventually packaged as a one hour special that went on the radio all across the country. And um, I still had stories to tell from the Super Indian universe. And I took those stories, developed them into a web comic and then into printed comics. Uh, currently there's two volumes of Super Indian out now. I'm working on a third. And in December, the Native Voices at the Autry, well, they came back to me and they said, hey, what if we did another round of audio theater episodes? Because a lot of people are tired of being on Zoom. You know, because we were, you know, straight into the pandemic, as we kind of still are. And uh, we did the uh, audio theater shows on Zoom. We recorded 16 different actors speaking 95 different speaking parts. And all of it was put together with audio files being sent to an editor in England, of all places. And he put everything together with the actors' performances sound effects and music and then the Autry is currently hosting those three episodes for free 
up on their website. It's, it's totally cool. <laughs> Where did your idea come from to create Super Indian? The idea started, oddly enough, in <laughs> Brisbane, Australia. I was at a theater uh, kind of retreat with uh, theater professionals from across Canada and the U.S. And we were talking to Aboriginal uh indigenous there um about you know how do we represent our community and one thing that i was talking to one of the other playwrights about was why aren't there more native superheroes that are actually written by native people drawn by native people and it was kind of a fun discussion but i took notes and that idea stayed in the back of my head for the longest time and hearkening back to my own love of comics because i am a big comic nerd I thought about, um, you know, everybody from, of course, Superman to Batman to Spider-Man, etc. But I really liked the idea of somebody eating tainted commodity cheese and gaining superpowers. Of course, they love to laugh and I love making them laugh. <laughs> and so there's a lot of humor <laughs> that's built into the show. This is not your sort of grim, you know, uh, kind of, you know, brooding superhero. This is a kid that had, lives with both of his parents in a native community and encounters his community every day as a janitor at the bingo hall. So he's got a very normal life, um, but there are elements outside of the his world in the, on the reservation that, you know, want to kind of mess that up, mess up the fun. So um, he is developing his powers because this tainted cheese, you just don't know what, you know, one day he's got ice breath, the next day he's got fire breath, the next day he's flying, you know, it's, it's fun. And I love having that element of surprise for this young guy. Arrigan, what are you working on now? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, one thing I'm really excited about is working with Cherokee author Tracy Sorrell on a children's book about uh, Chief, well, I don't want to say Chief, because but he's some, I think he liked it, Albert Bender, who was an Ojibwe pitcher for the Philadelphia Athletics, and Jack Myers, who is a Kahuya Indian, who was a catcher and a, a power hitter for the New York Giants. And in 1911, when of course I'm probably getting it wrong because I'm not looking at it. Um, this is in the early 1900s. They met each other as players in a World Series game. What? People don't know. <laughs> that was the creator of Super Indian, Arrogant Star. When we come back, a small Oklahoma town transforms into a movie set. Killers of the Flower Moon is in production on Osage land in Oklahoma. It's a crime story based on a dark chapter in Oklahoma history. It's directed and produced by Martin Scorsese, based on the nonfiction book by David Gran. Leonardo DiCaprio stars alongside Jesse Plemons, Lily Gladstone, and Robert De Niro. Shannon Shaw Duty, editor of the Osage News, tells us what it's like to have your town transformed into a movie set. We have uh, become accustomed to seeing the stars in the film. We've made relationships with uh, the actors that are in the film. They've been more than gracious and kind to all of us. Uh, you know, they, we just recently had our Elonchka uh, dances here and uh, Gray Horse, Hominy, and Pahuska. And uh, many of the film crew and cast, uh, including the lead roles um, and director Martin Scorsese, uh, they all uh, visited our Elonchka dances and even danced with us. So um, it was a sight to see. I don't know when we'll ever be able to say that, uh, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone were at our Elonchka dances, but it happened. And, you know, we're just uh, very grateful that they are continuing to make these inroads with the Osage community. The movie is based on true stories of greed and outside corruption brought on by the discovery of oil on tribal lands. The descendants of those tribal members are collecting stories about those days. 
We are calling it uh, Hope and Resilience, Osage Family Stories from the Reign of Terror. And what it is, is that it is a, a project for the community. Uh, it is uh, directed and, and you know, led by the Osage News, but what we really wanna do is provide a platform for all of these Osage families that have stories from the Reign of Terror, because growing up here on the Osage Reservation, almost every story, or almost every family has a story of what happened, you know, either they were, uh, had relatives that were, uh, uh, died mysteriously, uh, or they died young, uh, they were married to non-Indians, uh, so they uh, lost their, their share, uh, their head rights and their shares in our mineral estate, that happened quite often, a lot of families lost land, uh, they don't know how they lost it, um, you know, uh, guardians, uh, uh, took uh, you know money and 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 squandered wealth and and you know so these or took head rights away and so th these are stories that we want all of these families to tell. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is a wonderful book, but it only highlights one family, and there are so many families uh, on the Osage Reservation that suffered from this whole period, and it didn't stop. Uh, in 1925 or 1927, whenever Ernest Burkhart and, and Bill Hale went to prison. You know, it, it lasted for a very long time. And there are many of us that still believe that they weren't the main orchestrators of this event. We feel like the main orchestrators were uh, bankers, attorneys in Pahuska. So uh, William Hale and Ernest Burkhart were just, you know, lower level, uh, a lower level crime syndicate. So we feel like it was a major operation coming out of Pahuska that targeted many, many Osage families to take their land and their, and their head rights away, their money. So what we wanna do is uh, uh, give those families a chance to tell their story. So it's not just one, one family story. And after all of these stories are told, we're going to compile them into a book. That was Osage News Editor, Shannon Shaw Duty. A woman from the North Slope of Alaska is one of the very first Inupiat conservation biologists. Caitlin Onoa Boysell has the story. So I guess let's start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, what, how did you get involved in this? There was one particular moment when uh, I was a teenager and we were out in an aluminum boat um, out on the, the ocean and uh, we cut the engine and we're just sitting there and we have the midnight sun where I come from um, in Okavik, Alaska. And um, we had a pod of like 200 beluga whales that came came through the region um, and just hung out with us at the boat. And that is a pretty rare occurrence. From then on, Victoria's passion for wildlife became her mission. Her goal was simple, to put indigenous values first. I come from a whaling village um, and whaling is a very important activity for us, but of course like conservation from a Western standpoint is very much focused on the preservation of species, the preservation of lands in ways that aren't necessarily conducive to indigenous peoples. So I wanted to learn about conservation and how we could do it in a way that was more in line with um, indigenous values, Inuit values. Victoria says putting indigenous people in charge of wildlife should be the foundation. We also, of course, need indigenous knowledge and we need um, community members who really know the landscape to be making those decisions about how best to uh, conserve lands, species, waters, all kinds of decisions that indigenous communities, at least in the Arctic, make every day. But when you put in the hard work, you get to see the payoff. This is the most progress that we have seen, the most recognition of our rights and sovereignty as indigenous peoples, as native peoples um, that we've seen since the 70s. In Oklahoma, Caitlin Anawa Boisell, Indian Country Today. Indian Country Today's managing editor is Jordan Bennett Begay. She joins us from our Washington DC Bureau. Welcome Jordan. What's it like to juggle a virtual newsroom with reporters all over the country? So number one thing for us is communication um, and communication, you know, within our communication platforms, phone calls, text messages, Zooms. Um, and much of it actually uh, has stemmed from lessons in the past year 
uh, or actually maybe last three years um, and just seeing how our communities react um, and just seeing what is best for them so the news gets to them the quickest. Um, we have different processes depending on the news and how much we already know. If it's something unexpected, if it's news you already have background on, or news that we anticipated and have some, have a report pre-written already. Um, and you know what we know will determine um, how we reach our readers in the best way. And you know we can reach them on our digital platform you know, in the form of a story, an email blast, and on social media. And of course, in all this chaos, we have to you know keep in the back of our mind that we need to communicate um, that breaking news to our broadcast arm so they can you know um, carry out that plan on their side. So our goal is to you know build comprehensive coverage of indigenous communities, right? And you know, with a small team of reporters that we have, we can't do it all. So we try to form these partnerships in order to cover as much of Indian country as we can and you know and globally, you know, the whole indigenous world. Um, one partnership of course we have is with the uh, Associated Press. Um, we are an AP member, and so this allows us to share their content, but also indigenize it, as I like to call it. And uh, they have an, a sharing platform that's called AP Story Share um, with other news organizations. So this allows us to grab their content and to share it as well. Um, another one that our senior editor, Diana Hunt, Hunt um, got us in was with Covering Climate Now, and that's a global media consortium of more than 450 media partners. And we've been able to share a couple of stories from uh, Marinette Pember and Richard Walker with them. And so that uh, shared, those stories are shared globally. Um, and another one I'm really, another partnership I'm really excited for is with Underscore. Um, so this is a very new partnership and that we are, I, I like to see in the sense of it's a temporary bureau in the Pacific Northwest. So we're going to share a reporter um, who's going to cover that region, you know, Washington, Oregon, parts of Idaho, and um, the lower, you know, southern um, half of British Columbia. And I'm really excited for this because um, this might be a new model that we're going to use for other partnerships. And the last one is we are also partnering with other uh, J schools or journalism schools, such as the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University and the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Oklahoma. Our policy is, you know, our content is free to use and, you know, they can share our stories and we do often see it pop up like in the Navajo Times and um, I don't know, the Gallup Independent on Navajo. I'm only saying Navajo because that's my community. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and there's also, you know, a lot of non-Indigenous news outlets as well as the Associated Press were able to feed our copy to them if they're interested. And then we've been able to share more than a dozen stories um, since we've been an AP member with them. And you know, this just contributes to us um, and our goal of changing the narrative of indigenous people, which is really exciting. Jordan serves on the NAJA board, the Native American Journalists Association. Of course, NAJA's um, goal continues to be, um, you know, serving and empowering native journalists um, through various programs and to also promote diversity promote diversity in newsroom, newsrooms, especially in mainstream media, um, and defend any challenges to free press, free speech, or freedom of expression. Um, but I guess like one update from NAJA, uh, a couple of updates from NAJA is the release of the Indigenous Media Guide for reporting on First Nations and Métis communities. Uh, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and APTN News partnered with NAJA to create these guides and they are published in English, Spanish, and French. Um, and this is you know, really important because Naja recognizes that indigenous people are very distinct. You know, no two tribal nations are the same, and these guys will help journalists um, in reporting on them accurately. That was ICT's managing editor, Jordan Bennett Begay. Ty Defoe is Ojibwe and Oneida. He's a versatile artist who identifies as two-spirit. He's collaborated on Grammy award-winning albums. He's an actor, dancer, and a writer. Karina Dominguez talked with him about his projects from New York. 
Buju tied to foe indigenous nakaz was swagging in dunja ba magizan in dodem. Tied to foe operates at the intersection of various art forms to bring a much needed perspective as an indigenous queer artist. I feel like it's really important as a native indigenous person not to be labeled and put into a box, but that I can expand that box. He's creating art that centers around his identity, social change, climate justice, restorative justice, and language revitalization. Recently, Defoe was commissioned to create a piece titled Strong Like Flower. He composed a song with flutes, drums, and electronica music. To me, that video was a visual representation as sovereignty as it relates to queerness. So, in fact, I was queering space as an indigenous person and showing up as my radical self. Holding space for indigenous queer voices in the art world is his passion. I would really appreciate and love if more folks begin to amplify stories and also invited and hosted um, to spirit indigenous queer individuals to create, to make, to just be part of the conversation. Currently, Defoe is planning something historic that's never been done before. The first two-spirit indigenous queer pop-up powwow, and it's scheduled to take place in Arkansas this September. In New York, Karina Dominguez, Indian Country Today. For more news and updates, visit IndianCountryToday.com. It's Independence Day weekend. From all of us in the newsroom, we wish you a safe and happy holiday. I'm Alia Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.